Boom! Shake the room, Fire Nation. JLD here, and welcome to Entrepreneurs on Fire, brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network with great shows like My First Million. Today, we're pulling a timeless EO Fire classic episode from the archives, and we'll be breaking down how to raise $400 million on the internet and build a fintech business. To drop these value bonds, we are brought to Jillian Hellman into EO Fire Studios. Jillian is the founder and CEO of Realty Mogul, a private market investing platform for commercial real estate. And today, Fire Nation, we'll talk about a hundred coffee meetings, what that looks like. We'll talk about the alternative to hustle and hard work and so much more when we get back from thanking our sponsors. Want to scale your business but don't know where to begin? Start and grow your online course business with Thinkific, the easiest way to turn your expertise into revenue. Try Thinkific for free today at thinkific.com slash E-O-F. That's T-H-I-N-K-I-F-I-C dot com slash E-O-F. The Remarkable People Podcast, hosted by Guy Kawasaki and brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, helps you better understand the changing world with interviews from thought leaders, legends, and iconoclasts like Jen Lim, happiness evangelist and author of Beyond Happiness. Listen to the Remarkable People Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Jillian, say what's up to Fire Nation and then share something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. Hi there, Fire Nation. I'm glad to be on the podcast today. I I think the interesting thing most people don't know, well, I've lived in a lot of different countries. So I lived in China, I lived in Spain, I lived in Italy, I lived in Japan, and then uh, grew up here in the good old US of A. So I've gotten to be a citizen of the world, which has been a lot of fun. Cool. Whereabouts in Italy? Uh, I spent quite a bit of time in Florence. I have not been. I just actually got back from a trip that took me to Rome and Naples and the Amalfi Coast. So Florence will have to be on my to-do list. Yeah, it's pretty neat. I was in uh, Lake Como earlier this year as well, which is just gorgeous. That's actually a trip I'm doing next fall. So we may have to exchange notes after the interview is done. But Fire Nation, you are here because you're fired up about this audio masterclass. How to raise not one, not two, but $400 million on the internet and build a fin tech business. And we're going to really get into the weeds on all these specifics. But before we do, Jillian, just give us a real quick overview, just maybe a couple teasers of what we're going to be chatting about here today. Yeah, sure. So I'm the founder and CEO of Realty Mogul, and we are one of the largest online marketplaces for investing in real estate on the internet. So started the company about six years ago. You know, we've grown tremendously quickly and have now raised over $400 million on the internet to help investors get exposure to real estate. So we're going to share some of the secrets and some of the inside tips of how we did that. Well, let's start right at the beginning, because that's where I love to kind of build the journey, build the story, which is how you got started. And, And why did you actually even choose fintech as a business at the start of that journey? Yeah. So if we go all the way back, kind of as a kid, I remember, you know, two, three years old, I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family. So my father's an entrepreneur, um, had factories in China, was bringing inventory over from China into the U.S., selling to, you know, Walmart and Bed Bath & Beyond and a lot of the big retailers. And so we always talked about dinner, about entrepreneurship at the dinner table. Uh, We were constantly talking about businesses, you know, pitfalls. And my dad would talk a lot about the pitfalls of inventory. So physical goods, shipping physical goods. And so when I went off to school and he said, you know, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, I want to sell money, right? I want to be in the money business. And he goes, (laughs) you know, why do you want to be in the money business? And I said, because dad, I never want to deal with inventory, right? I I grew up for 18 years around the dinner table hearing about the perils of inventory. So I always knew I wanted to go into financial services. Um, I went to university at Georgetown, came out of there, went into work for in banking, um, was in banking for about five years and really, really got to love financial services, you know, really got to understand very deeply kind of how wealthy people made their money, how wealthy people got even wealthier. And a lot of that led me back to real estate. Um, I'd had some real estate in my family as well. My grandfather built a property in Los Angeles uh, that was kind of passed down through family generations. So we'd always talked about real estate. My mom was in luxury residential real estate where I grew up. So kind of this mix of 
no inventory plus financial services plus real estate um, led me to banking. And then that led me to eventually quitting and, and starting Realty Mobile. Well, before we do go any further, what exactly is fintech? I know it's two words kind of smashed together, but break that down for us. Sure. So it's financial services on one end and technology on the other end. So, you know, it could be a lending business, could be an investing business, could be a, you know, robo advisor, for example, but just something that's at the intersection of financial financial services and technology. So the internet, you know, digital distribution, um, using technology to provide a better customer experience to your clients if you're an investing business or a lending business or something of that nature. So one thing that I'm sure is a very important aspect of fintech, like it is on many of the different businesses that we talk about here in Entrepreneurs on Fire, is culture. So like, let's talk about culture. And what kind of culture do you think that you need to build to be a successful fintech business? And if you did focus on that, like, how did you actually build that type of culture at your company? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I came out of the banking world. So, you know, I, and a lot of that culture permeates through our company. You know, it's it's a more serious culture than you would typically find at a true technology company or a pure play technology company like a Snapchat or a Facebook or, you know, something in the social media realm. You know, that's not us, right? We're we're more serious. We're more buttoned up. We're, we're very detail oriented. We're very thorough. You know, we're a highly regulated business. So you have to cross the T's. You have to dot the I's. Um, we have to slow down long enough to understand a lot of the ramifications of our decisions. So you'll hear some technology companies or pure play technology companies say, you know, move fast and break things. We can't move fast and break things when we're moving $400 million across the internet, right? So we've really built more of a, I would say, kind of detail-oriented, buttoned-up culture. And and that's, you know, culture tends to start from the top. So, you know, I came straight out of banking into building this business. Um, I tend to be that way where I'm asking a lot of questions. I'm digging in, you know, pretty deep into the details. And the team expects that now, right? And they emulate that behavior now where kind of everyone works cohesively together to make sure that we are protecting our investors. And and we really have built this culture around investor protection, kind of being the North Star, right? Doing what we need to do to make sure that we're properly protecting investors. And that permeates, you know, up and down our culture today. Fire Nation, what kind of culture are you permeating in your company? It's so critical because it does start at the top. It starts with you, the person who is running the business, the person you know who started the business, the person who founded the business. So think about that. Are you standing for something? Is what you're standing for, is your culture permeating up and down the different levels? Critical to think about. And Jillian, I want to rewind for a minute here because you're at 400 million now and of course higher even as we're speaking. But what was it like raising that first $1 million? What was that like? How did you do it? So it's funny, you know, we, we've raised $400 million to invest in, in real estate. Um, in addition, I've raised $45 million in venture capital to fund the business. So in aggregate, you know, in the last five years or so, I've raised almost $450 million. And if I go back to that first million dollars, it, it was so, so hard. I mean, genuinely, our first million dollars was probably harder for me to raise than the last a hundred million oh, that totally, we've raised. Totally, yeah. Um, which is astonishing to think about. But um, I I use this philosophy called tornado networking. So what tornado networking is is you meet one person. So I would meet an angel investor. You know, the first million we raised was our angel round, right? We needed money to build the software, to build the technology, to hire you know one person, right? At the time, it was just my co-founder and I. Um, so I use this philosophy called tornado networking, where you meet someone. So angel investors know angel investors. Rich people tend to know rich people. So I would meet an angel investor, and then I would ask them for five introductions. And then I would ask those five people for five more introductions. So you just start to you know, compound on the number of introductions that you have and the number of rich people that you're around, is sort of what my philosophy was. But I had over 100 coffee meetings to raise our first million dollars for the company. And, and I don't drink coffee. So, you know, it was, it was mind numbingly challenging. Um, but you, it's part of being an entrepreneur, right? You keep pushing through and you keep, you know, making it happen to get your company off the ground. But you know, that, that first million was way harder than the last hundred million. Fire Nation, tornado marketing. Think about that. How can you use it in your business? And believe me, 
it is so critical and so key to focus on. I mean, I look back to 2012 when I was thinking about starting this podcast called Entrepreneurs on Fire. It's going to be a daily podcast. And Jillian, like you, like I knew that I needed mentors. I needed people that could guide me and who had been there and done that. So I hired a mentor, a incredibly successful business podcast host. Her name was Jamie Masters of The Eventual Millionaire. I hired Cliff Ravenscraft, the podcast answer man. They are brilliant people, but they both told me the same thing. John, you will never find enough entrepreneurs to do a daily podcast. It's just not possible. But I I thought to myself, wait a second, what if I find one entrepreneur? And are you going to tell me that that one entrepreneur doesn't have one or two or five uh, other entrepreneur friends that they can actually recommend and introduce me to, to be on the show? And I, I only need one recommendation from each interview I have. But what if I get two? What if I get five, like Jillian was asking for? And guess what? That's exactly what happened. After the interviews was over, I'd be like, Jillian, you rock the mic. By the way, do you have any other entrepreneurial friends that you think would be a good fit for the show? I mean, I'd love to have them on. And I would get one, two, five introductions every single time. And guess what? I did 2,000 episodes over 2,000 days using your version of Tornado Networking, Jillian. I never heard it you uh, call Tornado Networking before, but that's exactly what I did. So Fire Nation, how can you do what Jillian did? How can you do what I did to grow a successful network, to grow a successful business? It is so huge, so key. And anything you kind of want to add to that, Jillian, before we move on? It's critical, you know? At the end of the day, who you know is, is going to make or break your company. And the thing is, who you're talking to knows people. It's just a matter of asking them, making that ask. Now, you hacked your way to building a two-sided marketplace. First off, explain what that means, two-sided marketplace, and then break down how you hacked that. Sure. So we are a two-sided marketplace. So Realty Mogul you know, is a two-sided marketplace. On one side of the Realty Mogul marketplace, we have investors. So these investors come to our website and they're looking for commercial real estate investments. On the other side of Realty Mogul, we have real estate companies that we work with. And these real estate companies are looking for investors in their deals. So we had to build both sides, right? And you had to try and build them in lockstep where you had you know, investors on one side, real estate companies on the other side. So I knew that in order for the business to be successful, I needed to go find wealthy people who wanted to invest in real estate, right? I had to build kind of that investor side first so that when the real estate companies would come and post a transaction, there would actually be capital there and their transaction could be capitalized, right? We could fund the transaction. So interestingly, I started thinking through how can I find, you know, wealthy people and how can I pitch them kind of at scale? So I did a ton of angel investing pitches. I did angel investing pitches in California. I did them in Texas. I did them in New York. I even did, you know, a set of them in Dubai, if you can believe it. Wow. Um, so I was just anywhere that I could get in front of wealthy people. And, and it was kind of, you know, these, these, I was pitching the company, right? So these were angel investors. And at the time, you know, we were raising capital for the company as well. You know, we're always raising capital for the, for the company when we we're starting out. So I was pitching them on the company, but what I really wanted them to do was to go check out our website and invest in real estate with us. Right. So it was kind of this, this hack to get in front of all of these wealthy people, because if you're an angel investor, you know, at least in the U S you have to be accredited, which means that you're wealthy. So I had to figure out a way to get in front of them. So I got in front of thousands and thousands and thousands of investors who were really Really our target market for one side of the marketplace. And then once we had, you know, some traction on that side of the marketplace, we could actually put transactions on the website to get those transactions funded. So that was kind of the hack was, you know, go to all these pitch events, go to all these angel investing events, pitching the business. But in reality, I wanted these wealthy investors to come online and, and invest in real estate with us. The reality is this, Jillian. I mean, you figured that out. You figured out how to hack your way into building that two-sided marketplace. But as entrepreneurs, we all have times when we think or even we know our business isn't going to work for any number of reasons, outside forces, inside forces. But what was that moment that you knew in your heart of hearts that your business was going to work? What was that just moment in time you're like, holy crap, this is actually going to work? Yeah, you know, entrepreneurship and, and building companies is just a bunch of zigging and a bunch of zagging. So there's there's these moments kind of at different stages of the corporate life cycle that I remember really vividly. You know, when, when we did our first transaction, it was like, you know, my parents put $25,000 in the deal. My buddy put $25,000 in the deal. It was kind of all money that that I knew, right? And I was I was having conversations with these people. But I remember somebody gave us $25,000 on the internet that I'd never talked to, right? Never talked to, never interacted with, didn't know who the guy was. 
Um, so that was like, oh my gosh, this is going to work, right? And at that time, we'd raised less than a million dollars on for real estate transactions, not for the company, but for real estate transactions. And then I remember, you know, I in the early days of the business, I would personally call every investor that signed up. You know, we had like a thousand people who signed up, and I was just working my way through this list of a thousand investors who had signed up. And I remember I called uh, this guy Jack. And I pick up the phone. I was calling from my cell phone. I was working out of my living room. You know, we didn't have an office. We didn't have corporate phones. This is, you know, very, very early days, six years ago in the business. And I pick up the phone and I call him. I say, Jack, you know, I saw that, you know, you joined us online. You made an investment with us. Um, I'm the CEO. If you have any questions, you know, we'd be happy to answer them. And Jack says, I'm investing with you on the internet for this exact reason that I don't want to talk to you. I sent you a million dollars. Click. <laughs> And I was like, Jack sent us a million dollars on the internet and didn't want to talk to me, right? And I was like, okay, this is going to work. And then we crossed 10 million in transactions funded. And I said, okay, this is an amazing milestone. And then it was 100 million in transactions funded. And it's like, okay, this is a milestone. And then it was 250 million in you know, capital raised on the internet. And I'm like, we just raised a quarter of a billion dollars on the internet. This thing's going to work, right? It's going to work. So that's kind of, so those milestones. Fire Nation, we all need to set those milestones and then celebrate those milestones. I mean, you are not going to hit that target unless you have that actual target. So just make sure that you're setting those audacious goals every month, every quarter, every half year, every year, and just, you know, keep your finger on the pulse. Are you hitting those? Why? Why'd you hit those? Why were you successful? Are you not hitting those? Well, let's do a little after action report and find out why we're not hitting those numbers. But if you are not setting any kind of goals, then you're just going to be this rudderless ship out in the Atlantic Ocean during a Category 5 hurricane, period, end of story. And if you think, Fire Nation, that Jillian is done dropping value bombs, you are sadly mistaken. So stick around because we'll be right back after we thank our sponsor. Customer demand is at an all-time high. In order to meet that demand, we as entrepreneurs and business owners need to ensure our back-end systems and software are providing our teams the sturdy platform they need to succeed. And what does that look like? A CRM platform that is ready to adapt to changing environments can be the difference between business growth or failure. And a HubSpot CRM platform can give you exactly what you need to help your teams thrive. They do it with next-level features like HubSpot Teams, where you can organize your account by teams and segment leads sort through content, and easily report on each team's performance. And that's just the beginning. Their sequences help you automate outreach, follow-up, and time-consuming tasks. Give your teams the power to create flows of time to personalize emails, remind them of important follow-up tasks, send in-mail and connection requests on LinkedIn, and bulk enroll multiple contacts at a time. Learn more about how a HubSpot CRM platform can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. Online training is skyrocketing across every industry and thousands of entrepreneurs, just like us, are using Thinkific to create, market, and sell online courses. But don't just take our word for it. Meet Kat Norton, the 27-year-old founder of Miss Excel. Through playfully combining dance and bite-sized Excel tips on TikTok and Instagram, Kat went from living in her childhood bedroom to amassing over a million followers in a seven-figure course on Thinkific. Only two months after launching her first course, Kat was quickly seeing so much success that she quit her day job. Since then, she's created 10 more courses on Thinkific and has more than 10,000 enrollments. By teaching online, she's been able to train thousands of people how to use Excel, all while freeing up time for herself and making passive income. If you're ready to create an online course as a lasting way to reach a wider audience, build revenue, and make an impact, then Thinkific is the perfect partner to have by your side. Get started at thinkific.com slash EOF. That's T-H-I-N-K-I-F-I-C dot com slash EOF. OF. So Jillian, we're back and ah, there's just a lot of questions that I have overall when it comes to raising capital on the internet through crowdfunding, all these different things. You figured it out. You know what the secret is. So break it down for us. What is that secret to raising capital on the internet through a thing called crowdfunding? Oh my gosh. It's, it's so hard. But if I had to distill down to one thing or sort of one secret, I think it's tell a story. For every one of our properties, uh, when we go to raise capital, right, on the internet, we're always telling a story, right? What's the story for the property? What's the business plan for the property? You know, why do we think this is going to work? Why are we a believer? You know, I think about like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, which are obviously different than our business, right? At Realty Mogul, we're, we're investing in real estate and Kickstarter and Indiegogo, you're investing in a, you know, a game or a movie or, or something of that nature. But I think that theme is tell a story. 
You know, in, investors want to feel, right? This is a, we all want to feel as human beings, right? It's it's critical and sort of inherent in our in our nature is to feel. And one of the ways that you can get investors to feel is by telling a story. Um, and I think that we've done a really good job of that, of really conveying what's the story for this individual property? What's the story for this individual investment? And if you're going to invest in a multifamily apartment building with us, who are the tenants that are going to live there? Right? Where are they going to work? You know, where are the the major employment hubs? Um, what are the kind of what do they do for fun? Right? Where's the nearest mall? Where's the nearest Whole Foods? How are they going to live their lives? Right? So we we really try and paint a picture and tell a story about about the real estate. Right? And you know, these are buildings. Right? They're they're tangible. The buildings don't have emotion, but human beings we all have emotion. So we try and evoke emotion and and really tell a story about our investments. Well, sadly, Puerto Rico's nearest Whole Foods is off the island, and that's a really sad thing. <laughs> but it's just a story that we have. But uh, Jillian, you couldn't be more right. I actually built my media empire, um, this podcast, Entrepreneurs on Fire, by telling stories. We always ask my guests, what is your worst entrepreneurial moment? Tell us that story. What is an aha moment you've had? Tell us the story of that aha moment. You know, Tell us the story of a typical day. We're going to get to a couple of these things with you later on in this interview, but stories are so critical, Fire Nation. There's a reason why history is broken down into his story, because that's exactly what it is. It's stories. We are humans. We tell stories. And on that note, Jillian, can you give us maybe a specific example, a specific story um, that can kind of emulate exactly what you're talking about? Like, how did you tell a story about a specific property? What was that story? I would love to hear a story that you told to a potential investor that made that sale. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a simple one, right? There's a there's an apartment building that we invested in, and the entire story, the entire business plan behind this apartment building, it's going to sound like duh and so simple, but it was install washer and dryer, right? And that sounds so crazy, right, to say we're going to install washers and dryers, and it was maybe a 200-unit apartment building. So we're going to install 200 washing machines, and we're going to install 200 dryers because this tenant, right, the people who were living in this building, they don't want to go to the laundromat anymore. Right. And if we install washers and dryers, suddenly we can charge 50 more dollars per unit a month. And that's going to lead to potentially great returns for our investors. Right. So it's it's simple stuff sometimes in real estate. I mean, there's another story we're working on a or we're looking at a transaction right now that we haven't decided if we're going to do an investment with or not. But the business model behind there is to uh, change the electricity out. Right. So right now the electricity is through the roof and we're going to install modern boilers, modern electricity systems. And we're going to bring the electricity bill down from, you know, 40 percent expense ratio to a 20 percent expense ratio. Right. These are kind of the ideas in real estate. It's obviously you know nuanced in real estate and, and it's very kind of detailed what your business plan is going to be. But those are the kind of stories that we tell. Um, you know, we've done transactions where the property is a block from the beach. Right. And so the story that we tell is, you know, the the tenants are tend to be, you know, young professionals who want to live a block from the beach and are willing to pay more than surrounding neighborhoods because it's critically important to them that they can walk, you know, 50 feet and have their toes in the sand. You know, so those are the kinds of stories that we tell that, you know, are reflective of the types of properties that we've invested in historically. Yeah, here's a random story that actually doesn't have much to do with what we're talking about, but it just kind of <laughs> came up in my mind. So I'm going to tell it real quick. But Kate and I were just in Rome and we were doing an audio walking tour through Rome. And Rick Steves has these amazing audio walking tours. So we just have our AirPods in. We're listening to the audio walking tour. And it was created in 2016. And we were walking through, um, like it's called like the Traverse Day neighborhood within Rome. And he's like, as you're walking through these streets, look up, you're going to see all of the people drying their clothes, you know, on the clothes hangers and like, just look up. It's just like part of the neighborhood. And like, we looked up at that moment and there was absolutely no clothes hanging in, in any of the alleyways. <laughs> and we actually went into a store, uh, like a little while later. We're like, Hey, why is there no uh, clothes hanging in any of these alleyways? Like Rick Steves just two years ago was talking all about it. He's like, Oh, everybody's got washer and dryers. We all have washers and dryers now. And we're like, Oh, <laughs> so I guess that's what happens now. So fire nation, tell stories. That random example that I just shared doesn't really add any value, but just shows you that things are important to certain people. Just like those 200 washer and dryers were important to those people. You know, those kids being able to walk 50 yards with a surfboard under their arm so they could, so they could easily surf, you know, to get to the beach. That was the story that they wanted to hear. And for you, Jillian, there's no such thing as a typical day. You're an entrepreneur. There's just no such thing. But I would love to know, like, what does a day look like for you, either typical or atypical? What are you doing from morning until evening? Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll share with you kind of this week, right? So this week, Sunday night, I flew to Austin, Texas. Um, Monday morning, I went and saw a property that we own or have invested in outside of Austin. Then I drove two and a half hours in an Uber, you know, taking calls the whole way to Dallas. I went and walked a property that we are invested in in Dallas. Then I drove to Irving, Texas. I went and walked a property that we own and, and invested in in Irving, Texas. Then I hopped on an 8 p.m. flight. Um, I got home at, I don't know, 10 o'clock, plus or minus, Monday night. I uh, was back in my office 8 a.m. Tuesday morning meeting with our team, right? So I, I try and spend a lot of time with our team. So we have a real estate team, we have a marketing team, we have a technology team, we have an operations team, we have a finance team. So I try and kind of get get time with all these guys. Um, we did a big launch this week, actually. So we relaunched RealtyMogul.com. We launched a, a huge rebrand that we've been working on for months and months and months. So that was a ton of fun. So at 10 o'clock Tuesday night, we went live. We brought the site <laughs> nice. down for half an hour. We went live. So I, I you know, I was home, kind of plugging away, you know, making sure that everything was running smoothly. You know, our tech guys are, are fantastic. They did, you know, all the hard work. I got to look at the the pretty website and the pretty pictures when they were done and and went live. Um, you know, Wednesday afternoon, I coordinated a champagne toast for the company so that we were celebrating the rebrand, um, you know, by, by Thursday, which was yesterday, I had an offer in my inbox to acquire, you know, one of our competitors. So I was working through that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been a crazy week, but every week is sort of crazy, but I, I split my time between, you know, being physical with the real estate. So walking real estate properties, spending time with our team, talking to investors, right? I mean, spending time with our investors is really critical, whether it's me doing a webinar or, you know, us hosting a dinner or having, you know, investors come into our office. Um, we had some investors in our office yesterday, so I, I met with them. Um, and then, you know, the rest of my afternoon today, you know, I've got two one-on-ones. We're going to do product prioritization with the technology team now that we've launched kind of our rebranded website at Realty Mogul. And then I've got an investment committee meeting where we're going to be approving, you know, potentially four new investments for the marketplace for investors to have access to. So that's kind of a whirlwind, but that's my weakness. <laughs> well, let me just cut in by saying, number one, love the updated website. I don't know what it looked like before, but I'm on it now. And where is that house? Is that in LA? I mean, that is just a gorgeous looking house, super modern, all glass. And it looks like it might be looking over LA. Yeah, we've got some cool imagery on on the new website. Um, we did a lot of LA. We did a lot of Malibu. There's even some grease kind of filled in throughout there. You know, oh, yeah, we I really wanted to evoke kind of, you know, this this idea of dreaming, right? This yeah. idea of if you had, if you could earn passive income, and you know, a big part of what we what we talk about is passive income and generating passive income from investors. And so if you could earn passive income, you know, where would you, where would you visit? Where would you travel to? Where would you live? Um, so we'd really try to kind of evoke that type of emotion in, in the new imagery. So let me ask you this. You just talked about a lot of traveling where you were on the road, a lot of planes, trains, automobiles, et cetera, et cetera. Do you ever see a situation where maybe you like log on to TaskRabbit, go to Austin, and then just like hire somebody for $10 an hour to put a GoPro on his head and literally walk the properties as you're like talking in an earbud and just like recording and filming it? I mean, does that ever make sense? Or is it critical that you are actually on the ground in person doing that? You know, that's brilliant. I've never thought of having a, putting a, <laughs> taking a task rabbit and putting a GoPro on their head, but I, I really love that. You can even hire somebody off task rabbit that like knows how to fly a drone so they can just set a drone off and you can just actually, you can take remote control of the drone from wherever you're at and just fly it around. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. You know, I, I, so our philosophy is that someone from our company is going to step foot on every single property before we make an investment. Yeah. Um, they, well, that's just prudent underwriting, right? It, you know, you, you don't really know until you're physically there. You know, we do a lot of underwriting. We buy a lot of data. We have a lot of technology, you know, but you, you really have to feel it, right? You really have to walk into those units. You really have to see what the floors are. You have to see what the condition of, you know, the countertops and the bathtubs. And, it, you know, real estate is a very detail-oriented business. Um, so I, I don't think that we will ever move away from someone from my team walking every single property. Mm. Um, I don't walk every single property personally. You know, I, I couldn't, right? We're in we're in way too many properties. I, I would, you know, not be able to do it. But we've trained our team to be able to do it. So they can do that. But, you know, I, I love being on the ground with our, on our properties. You know, I love seeing where we're at in the renovations, you know, how those are coming along, how we've improved, you know, the the potential lives of the tenants. I mean, we, I just walked one of our properties in Dallas 
And this is actually a property that's in one of our REITs. So we have two REITs. Um, this property happens to be in Mogul REIT 2, which is our multifamily REIT. And a REIT is a real estate investment trust. So it's kind of a, a pooled vehicle of a bunch of different investments. And this property is called Serendipity. So we invested in it you know, a year ago. And now it's a, you know, 100% of the exterior renovations are done. 50% of the interior renovations are done. And I walk in and... I mean, the pool is like spectacular, right? There's a fountain, there's water flowing from the fountain. There's really cool pool furniture. It's like this really cool kind of hip vibe. And that is so not what it was a year ago, right? A year ago, it was, you know, dilapidated and worn down. And um, so that's really cool to see, right? And, and makes me really proud of kind of the the investments that we're making and the improvements that, co- that come on those investments. So I, I like being on the ground. I, I get a lot of energy and it jazzes me up. Well, Jillian, you've been on a journey. What would you say has been the best part of that entire journey? It's got to be the people. You know, I have just met some spectacular, spectacular people in, in entrepreneurship, right? I mean, being a CEO gives you access to so many interesting people from, you know, the venture capitalists who sit on our board to the venture capitalists who said no to me when I was raising capital to our investors who are all interesting. They have their own stories, right? You know, where did they, where did they earn the money to be investing in real estate with us, right? That's always, you know, an interesting question and leads to a ton of really interesting insights um, to my team, Right. I have an amazing team of individuals at the company across real estate, technology, marketing, finance, operations, um, and then other entrepreneurs. Right. The really neat thing, I think, about being a CEO is you can get access to other CEOs because you're you're experiencing so many of the same things. You're experiencing so many of the same emotions and trials and tribulations. And so you can relate to to other CEOs. Right. Even if you come from different backgrounds, or you live in different places of the world. You know, a lot of that that core emotion that you feel as an entrepreneur is very similar. So I've gotten to meet some amazing CEOs. You know, a lot of my my closest friends and my network are CEOs of companies. Um, which has just been fantastic. So I, I think that it's it's the access to people that I've been exposed to through the business. Let's flip the script and hear the worst part. The worst part of the journey, this one's actually really easy for me, a little raw and, and, and serious, but it's been health. Um, I got super sick about two years ago, which was really just from being run down, right? I mean, when you're stressed out all the time, your cortisol levels go crazy. You know, I was on a plane every two days, you know, two years ago, I did 70 speaking engagements in one year. I was just running myself ragged, right? I was running myself ragged. I was running myself to the ground. I wasn't eating properly. I wasn't sleeping properly. Um, so, you know, my, my health really, really suffered and, you know, I'd say it's the worst part of the journey. And in some, some respects a really positive part of the journey, because I learned a lot about healthcare. Um, I sit on the board today of a company called next health, which is a very forward thinking organization around health and wellness. And, you know, we do drip IVs, we do stem cell therapy, we do hormone therapy. Um, but for me, like I, I was just so depleted on basic vitamins and minerals. I wasn't eating fruit. I wasn't eating vegetables and I was, I was really, really sick. So you know, that was definitely the worst part of the journey, but it's led me to a place now where, you know, I feel super strong. I feel super healthy. You know, I work out, I eat vegetables, I eat fruit, I take vitamins. Um, and I learned a tremendous amount about healthcare. I, I was just a voracious reader. So I probably read, you know, 20 books on health and wellness to really understand what was right for my body. What did I need to do to, to nurse myself back to health? So I didn't end up in a hospital. Give me one book that you read over that period that you were like, wow, this is an awesome book about health and wellness. Anything by Mark Hyman. Mark Hyman is one of the best authors uh, in in kind of the world of of health and wellness. He focuses on functional medicine, which is to treat the cause, not the symptom. So a lot of Western medicine will give you a pill to treat the symptom, right? If you're anxious, they'll give you an anti-anxiety pill, right? If you're depressed, they'll give you an anti-depression pill. Mark Hyman's whole philosophy and the whole philosophy behind functional wellness is let's treat the cause, right? What's causing that? Um, you know, is it, is it stress from work? Is it stress from family? Is it a bad relationship? Is it, you know, some other issue where you can actually solve for the cause as opposed to just to just solve for the, the symptom? Love that. I'm a big believer in all that as well. And the biggest lessons, Jillian, that you would really say you took away from that entire experience? For the health experience, not necessarily the entrepreneurial experience, but for the health experience, I think it's be patient, right? Um, I, I was really frustrated around, you know, I would spend a month eating healthy and not being on the road and be like, why am I not healthy yet? Right. And you don't get healthy <laughs> in 30 days. Right. And then I would go back on the road and do everything that I was doing all over again and sleep four hours a night and, and be, you know, be stressed and, and then say, why am I not healthy? Right. So I think on the health one, it's, it's be patient. I mean, it's taken me really two years to, to get back to a place where I feel really strong. I feel really healthy. I have good energy. 
Um, so health just, it, it's a scary one and it, it can take a long time. Yeah, I'm a big believer in just focusing on 1% better every day, Fire Nation. Try to get 1% better in some area and that's going to add up. So Jillian, you dropped value bomb after value bomb on this audio masterclass. What is one thing of all the awesomeness you shared that you want to make sure that our listeners get a final, you know, value bomb to be dropped, a call to action? What do you want to share with Fire Nation? I think it's hustle right? Like there's, there's no excuse for hustle and hard work. There, there's no alternative to it. You know, if you want to build a business, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you got to wake up every single day and you got to hustle. And, but you know, I, I applaud the people who have figured it out and made a ton of money without, you know, having to work really hard and having to hustle. But I, I don't know. I don't know. How they, to don't do exist, so, they don't yeah, exist, Julian. They don't exist. I don't know. I don't know. But, um, you know, for me, it, it's hustle, right? Like it, you're going to get beat down every single day, you know, like in some way, shape or fashion, something bad happens to me every day. Oh, yeah. Right. And it might be, it might be a snarky comment. It might be a, you know, a weird email. It might be a delay on something. And you know, bad is you can define what bad is. These are not, you know, real bad issues. I, I you know, I've obviously experienced some, some really bad stuff in, in my life, not necessarily entrepreneurially, but just in general, but I, I think it's hustle, right? You got to hustle. You got to be resilient. You got to just every day, put one foot in front of the other. And, and even if you miss a day, so what you miss a day, right? And you get up the next day and you go, okay, I didn't have a great day yesterday, but I'm going to make today a better day. So try your best every day. And, and just hustle and know that it doesn't come easy and it's not supposed to come easy. And if it came easy, you know, the journey wouldn't be nearly as much fun. So if Fire Nation wants to learn more about what you and your company are doing or just take the next step and just continue to, to learn all this stuff that we're talking about here today, where can Fire Nation go? What should they do? What's your call to action? Yeah, go to www.realtymogul.com, R-E-A-L-T-Y, so Realty and then Mogul, M-O-G-U-L.com, and we hope that you'll invest with us, right? We're, we're all about opening up access to commercial real estate investments to investors and, um, you know, an investor can be can be almost anyone in America, right? Our minimum investment's $1,000, so we, we've really tried to open up access, so come visit us at realtymogul.com. Fire Nation, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You've been hanging out with JH and JLD today, so keep up the heat. And head over to eofire.com. If you just type Jillian in the search bar, her show notes page will pop up with everything that we've been talking about today. Links galore, you name it, it's all going to be there and realtymogul.com. Beautiful website. Uh, I went and checked it out. There's some really cool stuff over there. So definitely head over there as well. And Jillian, I want to say thank you for sharing your truth, your value, your knowledge with Fire Nation today. For that, we salute you and we'll catch you on the flip side. Hey, Fire Nation, today's value bomb content was brought to you by Jillian Hellman over at Realty Mogul, so thank you for that. And if you're ready to accomplish one big goal, well, check out the Freedom Journal because when you follow that step-by-step -step guidance, you'll accomplish one goal in 100 days. Thefreedomjournal.com is where you need to go. Use promo code podcast for a nice little discount, and I'll catch you there, Fire Nation, or I'll catch you on the flip side. Want to scale your business but don't know where to begin? Start and grow your online course business with Thinkific, the easiest way to turn your expertise into revenue. Try Thinkific for free today at thinkific.com slash EOF. That's T-H-I-N-K-I-F-I-C dot com slash E-O-F. The Remarkable People Podcast, hosted by Guy Kawasaki and brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, helps you better understand the changing world with interviews from thought leaders, legends, and iconoclasts like Jen Lim, happiness evangelist and author of Beyond Happiness. Listen to the Remarkable People Podcast wherever you get your podcasts.